Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Cryptic Corner, where we explore the unexplained, the supernatural, the paranormal, and hidden, the mysterious, the alien, the accursed, and the forbidden. Today, we got a, a bit of a, 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 a theme I've been doing. I'll take two uh, lesser-known uh, cryptids that are very similar. And I will uh, mash them together in a single video just to, to make sure we have uh, uh, plenty to talk about and the cryptic corner fills its time slot. So today is no different. The last time I did this, I did it with, a, with the Loveland Frog and the Woonin Toad. Uh, one's a giant toad, and one's the other an anthropomorphic frog. They're the odd couple. Um, but... Uh, I wanted to do that again because I enjoyed it so much. Um, so I'm doing it today, and we're doing it with uh, with two cryptid bears, both alike in monstrosity, in fair Beringia, where our scene lays. All right. So the first thing that we're going to look at in cryptic corner, let me get you pulled up here. Do, 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 Go hum Tom's Cafe and get copyright strike while I'm uh, pulling this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here we go. So, this is not a good wiki. Just to let you guys know. I've, I've explored this wiki enough to know that it's not a good wiki. But, it's a fun wiki. Um... This first one we're looking at is called the Bergman's Bear. The Bergman's Bear, uh, Ursus Arctos Piscator, uh, is an alleged and probably, see, probably, that's not, it probably, it's, a, it's an alleged and probably extinct subspecies of brown bear that lived on the Chamka Peninsula in Russia. The Bear was identified by a Swedish zoologist, uh, Sten Bergman, in 1920. Bergman determined that the bear was a separate subspecies after examining the hide, which had fur very different from the local bears, and a series of footprints measuring 14.5 by 10 inches, which he judged much larger than other bears in the Chalka, or com, com, how do you say this, Kamchatka, Kamchatka, there you go, Kamchatka. The Chimkatka brown bear is already bigger than most bear species. It's one of the biggest in the world, I believe. Um, there are a few bears bigger than the brown bears on the Russian, this Russian peninsula. Some think that the Cold War may have helped the population to recover because the Soviet military blocked access to the area at that time. The whole, this whole peninsula, it's pretty big. Um, because they couldn't have access to. So they think that these bears may have, yeah. See, here's the right, look at the size of, uh, of the native bears that already lived there. And he's saying, oh, this one was too big to be one of these. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting, right? All right. Uh, maybe the legend of giant bears helped keep people out of the, this area, too. Interest in the bear was revitalized in the 1960s. Hunter uh, Rodian Sivobolov? Sivobolov? That's a hard name, too. 
I'm gonna have lots of hard Russian names today. Ah, uh, remember that time I had all those French names? I was like, Bleh. it was like when uh, on Friends when Phoebe tried to teach Joey French. <laughs> Reported uh, claims by Kamacha Kamachatka natives of an unusually large bear they called either the Irkuios, roughly meaning trouser pulled down due to the appearance of the bear's hind legs, or the god bear due to its large size. All right, based on uh, Sivobolov's description, biologist N.K. Vereshagin suggests that the god bear might be a relic Arctodus simus, a massive extinct bear. The idea was coolly received by the scientific community, but the species have long slender legs, which disagree with Erquium as a reference to baggy pants where they are pulled down. However, a nearby Alaska, the Boone and Crockett Club announced that a grizzly bear taken by Larry Fitzgerald in 2013 near Fairbanks, Alaska will enter the record book as the largest ever taken by a hunter and the second largest grizzly skull in the world. That skull was found in Alaska and measured 27 and 13 16 7 inch 7 16 bigger than the Fitzgeralds. Many giant bears have been reported in Alaska. In the winter, an ice bridge forms between Russia and Alaska. It is possible that some large bears have moved to Russia and that they are getting bigger and bigger with every generation. Yeah, because bears known for their infinite growth, right? Bears that, that never stop growing ever. Like, uh, they're like snakes and crocodiles. They just keep keep on growing. No, that's not true at all of any carnivoran. All carnivorans are going to have a maximum size, and it takes uh, certain genetic uh, anomalies to, to make them uh, exceed or, uh, or be more massive than their natural... Uh, natural counterparts, things like uh, hybridization, as you see with the uh, with the ligers, um, which make them bigger than a lion or a tiger because of giantism uh, in their genetic. It causes giantism in their genetics. Uh, inversely, like if you cross the puma and a leopard, which are in different subfamilies, one's a feliform and one's a, a pantherine uh or one's a, a feline and one's a pantherine uh but they are um they are in two different subfamilies so their offspring are actually dwarves they're actually very small so and the idea that bears especially bears um in the uh ursus arctos family <laughs> in that little in that little group and i don't mean family like his family is obviously higher than that, but um, they're all going to be able to interbreed with each other. Grizzly bears and Kodiaks and Russian brown bears and polar bears as well, because polar bears are also well within that group. Um, anyway, so that was the Bergman's bear. Now... Here's some artistic renderings. But, let's see what this guy says. Portion of Siberia, Russia. A parano enthusiast, welcome to the video about Bergman's bear, a pop. Okay, keep talking. Why are you muted? Swedish zoology. Hello, fellow parano enthusiast, welcome to there we go. video about Bergman's bear, a possible real cryptid. In 1920, Swedish zoologist Sten Bergman was given a large blackbird bear pelt that was said it came from the Kamchatka Peninsula in the extreme western portion of Siberia, Russia. Since Bergman spent a couple years in Kamchatka, 
He knew it was too large to be a normal Kamchatka brown bear. Bergman did discover very large bear paw prints in Kamchatka. Believing he must have discovered a new Kamchatka. species, That's he named it Ursus Arctos Piscator. The bear has never officially been recorded since Bergman's 1936 paper on it. However, the area the bears are supposedly inhabiting is closed off by the military, with some of the military personnel claiming there are large bears roaming the off-limits area. Well, no doubt. So, it might just be mistaken identity, just a large version of the Kanchaka bear, or is it a new species? With the area being closed off, nobody can really investigate. But like I said, there is military personnel claiming there are large bears in the area, so this might actually be a real live animal. So yeah. thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, it, if it is, that means a subspecies of brown bear. But really, did want to like and share the video would be much appreciated. And if you want to see more of my content, subscribe for more paranormal activity. And I will see you guys later. Bye bye. All right, and then, so, and just to show that this guy's not a crank, Stin Bergman's not a crank guy. Uh, Bergman was born in uh, Rensseter, uh, Sweden, and was the son of uh, Professor Johan Bergman and uh, Kirsten Henriksen. He passed his uh, student exam, I guess that's what that is, it's, that's probably Sweden's version of a student exam anyway, I don't know how to pronounce it. But uh, in 1914, and obtained a Bachelor's of Art degree in 1917, uh, a philosophy degree in 1925, and became an honorary doctor in Stockholm in 1952, an honorary degree. So uh, he was acting assistant and acting director of the Swedish Museum of Natural History during different periods from 1923. Bergman was a popular science lecturer from 1923 and conducted tours of Central Europe. So he's not a crank, not a crank at all. It talks about, uh, yeah, uh, he was an explorer too, uh, kind of an adventurer of the time, right? But going all to all these far off countries. Um, Bergman was a popular science, yeah, there we go, and conducted tours in Central Europe in 1926, 1933, and 1955. In Italy in 1955 as well as Japan in 1960 and 1962. He was explorer in the Kamchatka uh, Peninsula in, from 1920 to 1923. That's where this story comes from. More about this bear. In the Kuril Islands from 1929 to 1930. In Korea from 1935 to 1936. And in New Guinea from 1948 to 1949, in 1952 and in 1953, and from 1956 to 1959, they kept track of his tour. Somebody must have had his tour schedule who wrote this, <laughs> this wiki article. Good grief. Uh, but, yeah, member of the Royal Danish Geography Society, travels to Japan, Korea, Cannibalism in New Guinea, personal life, awards, and all that good stuff. So he's he's not a, a some crank that's talking about oh there's giant bears in the in this wilderness. He's like a real scientist apparently. Uh, a falconer as well. Hmm. Anyway, and then so that's our uh, first bear. So then we can jump right across the. Right across the uh, Bering Strait here to the New World. Uh, this is McFarland's bear. The world's rare. This is from Guinness Book of World Record. We're going to look more into this. But the world's rarest bear is the very controversial species referred to variously as the patriarchal bear, McFarland's bear, or the unexpected bear, and known only from a single specimen. A very large yellow furred individual killed on June 24th, 1864, by two hunters in Canada's Barren Ground region. It was originally assumed to be merely a grizzly bear, and its skull and pelt were given to an amateur naturalist, Roderick McFarlane, who in turn donated them to the U.S. National Museum. 
when they were examined and formally documented in 1918 by renowned amateur naturalist Professor C. Hart Merriman. However, he considered the bear to be so different from all previously documented forms that he officially classified it as a new bear species, which he named uh, Vetolarctos in Opinatus, thus housing it in a new genus, too. Yeah, so that was the Guinness book. I found a little bit more on it, though, so I think we're going to dive in here about this, uh, the unexpected, you know, in Optinatus. Here in the Arctic tundra, along the polar shores of, yeah, this is the one I wanted to read, good, good. <clears throat> along the polar shores of Franklin Bay, we may meet a rugged, sun-bleached inhabitant of Canada's western northland, the barren ground grizzly. The characteristic disposition of this formidable animal may be fairly judged from experience, wrote the famous old naturalist and Arctic explorer Roderick R. McFarlane in his appended notes to Through the Mackenzie Basin. He was thinking perhaps of a particular incident that occurred some 82 years ago when two natives of Franklin Bay met and slew a great yellow bear. In his notebook, McFarlane wrote, about three weeks ago, previous to our arrival at Franklin Bay in the end of June 1964, two Eskimo hunters observed a brown bear at some distance and being for them well armed they went forward to meet it and did their best to annoy it by uttering very loud and shrill cries they made a stop however at a driftwood stand shortly before constructed by them for the purpose of shooting therefrom at the uh, passing geese and swans and then perhaps for action one of them carried a Hudson Bay single barrel flintlock gun and the other a spear formed by firmly attaching a long knife of Eskimo make to the end of a somewhat slender pole about six feet in length. When the bear had closely approached them, it was shot and severely wounded, which of course made it perfectly furious and it came on so very quickly that there was no time to reload the gun. But just as it was about to spring at them and close with the man that had fired at it with his gun, the other man stuck fiercely at it with the spear and both soon dispatched it with their knives. The animal will not only hug and if possibly crush in any unfortunate falling on into its clutches, but it will bite, also bite with its sharp teeth and scratch ferociously with powerful claws. An Indian and Eskimo have occasionally experienced to their cost. The bear it was duly skinned, the hide cured, and for the following spring shipped along with its skull to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. From McFarland, the incident was now closed. Neither he nor the two Eskimos who killed the bear had noticed any significant peculiarities about the, that, this particular bear. And to them, it was just another barren ground grizzly. In the course of time, it arrived in Washington and was eventually cataloged, number 1979 of the McFarland Collection, skin number 8706 and skull number 7149. Collected June 24, 1864. For more than 50 years, this yellow bear lay unnoticed in the archives of the United States National Museum. At last, when a sufficient number of big bears had been accumulated to warrant a review of the species, Dr. C. Hart Merriam, Dean of the American Naturalist, came across the McFarland specimen. This was no ordinary barren ground grizzly. 
nor was it u unique its unique yellow coat the basic character that separated it from all other living species because of the peculiarity formation of it, the teeth dr Miriam recognized it as a new genus and named it uh, velu arctos in optinus unexpected he discerned resemblance between it and the extinct bear arctotherium and trim arctos it was indeed fortunate that this eminent scientist made his discovery and was able to tell the world of the surprising creature just two years before McFarland's death. A search through the published notes in the records of early explorers has added little or nothing to our knowledge of this patriarchal bear. However, a significant paragraph in Casper Whitney's book on snowshoe on snowshoes to the barren ground published some 50 years ago and is interesting even if it does not prove that he himself met with this particular bear whitney who had apparently been you know, apparently seen the barren ground grizzly at the smithsonian institute wrote a bear is found in on the anderson river which is near the rocky mountains that corresponds to this one and it is possible it may make out into the barrens in the summertime but i doubt if it's more than a visitor and am convinced its real home is much nearer the mountains it is a peculiar looking bear seeming a cross between a grizzly and a polar and it has some peculiarities that its hind claws are as big as the fore claws while its head looks somewhat like that of an Eskimo dog very broad in the forehead with square long muzzle and ears set on quite like the dogs it has a very wide at the shoulders and is robe in color resembling that of a grizzly I didn't know robe was a color huh Yeah, I was not aware that robe was a color. We shall, where shall we, ret um, I'm losing my mind. Looking at the wrong paragraph, way down here. Um, where shall we turn for further light on this remarkable survivor? R.M. Anderson of the Canadian National Museum believes that it is not extinct as its habitation is in the remote realm of no man's land the edge of which is seldom reached by indian or eskimo it is possible that more of its kind may still roam this vast arctic tundra in northern canada but it is more likely that as ernst thompson Seton said this was like mcfarland himself the last of a rugged heroic wilderness race and it survived provi providentially to fall in his hands and furnish him a monument in the record of bear, bears of bygone days. Although the strange bear has not a great deal in common with the extinct giant bear Arctotherium and Trimarctos, the resemblance is were sufficient to suggest that McFarland's specimen might claim an ancient lin line of descent quite different from the ones that gave its better known bears today. Anyone who has associated with the friendly Indians of the Northwest has probably at some time or other heard them tell the story of a huge bear that in the times past made protracted raids in their country strangely enough i find no reference to this legendary storyline in literature though Seton, mcfarland and others noted explorers must have been familiar with them no matter where you go in the wilderness of the upper yukon on the barren waste of beyond the great slave lake or to the rugged mountain passes of British Columbia, the basic fact 
of this story are always the same. As much as uh, these Indians love to tell exciting stories of wildlife and their hunting experiences, I have always found them dependable and truthful. At first, they were reluctant to tell their stories to their fathers, seemingly a skeptical, a little skeptical themselves and doubtful of the white man's readiness to believe it. But eventually, sitting around the campfire, one gleans the story of a great carnivorous animal resembling a bear, which can kill a moose with one stroke of its paw and carry it away as easily as a lynx carrying a rabbit. If the listener seems not too skeptical, the Indians will continue to tell how after one of these bears raided the country, you can follow the trail of blood splatters on the upper branches of trees until eventually it's lost beyond the timberline where the beast came from and went. None of the Indians seem to know. The story, no doubt, has come has some truth and could have originally been brought by visiting Indians from the west where huge Kodiak bears, the largest living carnivorous animals in the world, tower above the stunted trees of the Pacific coast. It is also within the realm of possibility that some such giant bear actually existed here as Inopnatus did before the coming of the white men. All right, so that was our second bear that we're talking about. That's the uh, McFarland's bear. Most modern research uh, indicates that it was probably a hybrid. Um, the McFarland's bear is a proposed extinct species of bear that was found in the Canadian Northwest Territory in 1864. Naturalist Robert McFarland acquired an enormous yellow furred bear skin from the Inuit, as well as a bear skull. McFarland shipped the remains to the Smithsonian Institute, where they were placed in a storage as and soon forgotten. Eventually, Dr. Clinton Hart Merriam uncovered the remains, which he recognized as a new species, Ursus inoptanatus, in, eight, in 1918. He described the specimen as a new species and genus, uh, Vetolarctos inoptanatus, uh, calling it the patriarchal bear with the exception of unconfirmed sightings the McFarland's bear is sometimes thought to have gone extinct since the specimen was obtained in 1864 there have been many theories concerning the origins of the McFarland's bear which include suggestions that it may have been a grizzly polar bear hybrid or even a surviving uh, representative of a Pleistocene species it is known nowadays that grizzly and polar bear hybrids do occur on occasion and that they match the specimen's description very well. Notably, the pale tan fur and apparently also the oddly shaped skull, which led Miriam to propose his new genus. While this seems to be a satisfying explanation, it was not tested thoroughly because the hybridization theory was for long just that. Now that more than circumstantial data such as hybrids exist, ancient DNA analysis and or morphological study of the bear may well resolve the case of McFarland specimen. If it turns out that, or it turns out to be a hybrid, the scientific name Vettel Arctos and Ursus inoptinatus would become invalid under ICZN, so that's the zoological naming convention that we use. In episode 215 of History Channel's program uh, Monster Quest, Giant Bear Attacks, paleontologist Dr. D Blaine uh, W. Schulbert of Eastern Tennessee State University was allowed to examine the skull, although the Institute did not allow him to exa the examination to be filmed. Schubert stated that he was 100% sure that the skull, th that it was the skull of a young female brown bear and actually not particularly a large individual. So that was the, <laughs> the assessment of the skull. 
And here we're just going to look at some uh, some grizzly uh, and polar bear because uh, climate change has given us this hybrid. <laughs> cryptic corner for today a little bit shorter but that's okay because I actually have a video the reason I didn't have a video for this one like a, a full video that I reviewed and responded to was because I have a video for um I'm going to be responding to for hive side today which is a little bit special so um yeah so climate change is uh, impacting the way that animals migrate in the areas that they inhabit um, causing hybridization between uh, between brown bears and uh, and polar bears. So the problem, if there is a problem, um, with the hybridization. I mean, obviously there's a problem with the climate change. But the problem with the hybridization is it starts to um, for an animal that's uh, that's marginalized, like uh, like the polar bear, um, pushed back into a a depleting environment they may be absorbed it's p potential that they could on the long run be absorbed into the brown bear uh, species uh, around them whether in Russia or in North America and we see this happen we know that this can happen uh, we saw it happen with the African uh, wildcat once we domesticated it and brought it to Europe um, the native wildcats in Europe, which are very different and unique, uh, interbred with them. And now there's hardly any place in Europe that has uh, pure uh, European wildcats anymore. The Scottish wildcat is especially uh, marginalized, also called the Scottish tiger. And I will talk about that at some point because there's some cryptid stuff out there. But I got that planned for October because we're going to talk about the tag harem too, which is a uh, Scottish ritual that, um, that involves cats and all kinds of goodness. All right. So thank you for joining me for cryptic corner, uh, this evening. Uh, hope you like these, uh, these bizarre animal videos as well. Uh, please remember to be kind, take care, and we will see you next time. <laughs>